So the first session we're going to have is we're going to have a, a presentation of the key findings of a scoping study because as Conchianit mentioned this morning, there are several components in the MTT program and there were a few studies being done already and will be presented and there will be discussions. Now to help facilitate that session, may I ask my colleague, Ms. Ridi Saloja, Summernet Multi-Stakeholder Coordinator to facilitate. Ridi? Hello, uh, good morning everyone. As you just heard from Albert, this was last minute uh, action plan for me. So a very good morning to all of you. And it's a pleasure to have you here and to be your moderator for this first session on today's forum. So as Al Albert said that in this session, we would be inviting our component leads to present what has been the finding of the scoping study. So let me uh, now invite Dr. Lewis Lebel, who is uh, joining us online, who's leading the scoping study. So he's going to share the key findings from the scoping study on KP, uh, KBB IPOs in the Mekong. So over to you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you. Um, Albert, could I have the next slide, please? Okay, we're ready to roll. Everyone can see the... Okay. Connecting, engaging, learning, these are recurrent themes in efforts to enhance the resilience of social and ecological systems, not only in the Mekong, but around the world, but especially where users, resource managers, and policy actors draw on different knowledge systems for guidance. In today's talk, I highlight their importance to organizations seeking to provide policy advice on water, energy, and climate issues in the Mekong region. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah, thank you. Conventionally, governments turn to think tanks to generate new policy ideas. Public attention on think tanks has usually been fixated on their rankings rather than on their content. And most research about think tanks has been done in Western developed countries. Critical research studies conclude that think tanks are elitist, dated from the Cold War, international relations period, and gender blind with their roles and knowledge systems, whether they're producers or users or disseminators of knowledge, not at all clear because of the way they've been defined. In 2022, Wellstead and Howlett, some Australian workers on governance and public administration, introduced the notion of knowledge-based policy influence organizations. It's a horrible long string, but it's really quite a interesting and useful concept, I think, for the current program. And it's inspired quite a few of the ideas in, a, in the design stage already. Many types of organizations, aside from think tanks, potentially influence policy process and content. They do so in different roles, sometimes related to generating new knowledge, but also to apply it. Their, their contributions come from understanding different knowledge systems, local knowledge systems, the knowledge systems of policy practitioners, of academics, et cetera. And all of these as a basis for policy advice, which might be supportive or criticized or try to be neutral, or it may be commissioned, or it might the government might get it unsolicited. They didn't really want it, but they're going to get it. Next slide, please. Policy influence. depends on quite a lot of things. And this has been a working model in, in the group from when we started the idea of the work and that's where we got to so far. But it's, it seems quite important that collaboration in networks is important to policy influence. The way you engage, the, the, the type of meetings you facilitate or you go and give speeches or you give brochures and infographics matters. Whether the organization actually knows anything about Nexus, about the interactions between water, energy and climate is important. And the knowledge systems are important, among other factors. So can I have the next slide, please? So the scoping the objectives of the scoping survey, which is what I'll be talking about, were to identify these PIOSs, I'm going to call them PIOs, 
It's short for, I dropped the K and the B just for convenience here, really. To document their strategies and assess their influence. Okay, it's quite, even that is quite ambitious for a scoping study. To this end, we developed a questionnaire instrument and with a great effort of our partners, we collected information from 117 eligible organizations. So it's a middle size number, it's not the biggest possible, but it's quite a reasonable size. Next slide, please. Surveyed organizations in the four countries were diverse in form, age, and size. For example, 61% had been established for more than 20 years. That, that's, that's, a, that's a long time. That was, these are vintage organizations. 40% worked in more than one Mekong country. And even if you took a particular country and looked at who worked in those, there's quite a different mix between countries. For example, research and policy institutes were quite prominent in Cambodia and Vietnam. Whereas agencies somehow connected to government were actually more, more frequent in Thailand and Laos, for example. Those are the, the light blue in the pie charts. Come to the next slide, please. One third, so in these, in these types of graphs, I'm gonna be showing a few of these. Uh, the, the length of the bar is how many percent of the organizations we surveyed said yes to that characteristic. Most of the questions in the survey were yes, no questions, very simple, but they were about the organization. They weren't about the individual responding. So you'll see that formally registered, there's about a third of them that weren't formally registered and around a third of them that were not legal entities. So there's quite a few informal organizations active in the region on water, climate and energy issues. There's also almost half of them thought themselves were think tanks. They either used the label or had the label applied to them. Next slide, please. When it comes to the water, climate and energy system, almost two thirds of surveyed organizations had worked on all three issue domains. This doesn't mean they studied their interaction necessarily. They just did work. They might have been in different projects. We didn't ask the question cleverly enough to say they were working on the nexus. They probably weren't, but there's a lot of potential here. Next slide, please. And the left graph shows the water related issues and the right one shows energy related issues. And overall, you can see water bars are longer than energy bars. And there's a bit more topics in the water than the energy in the particular sample survey that we were collected. So some of the main issues for water, for example, are things like conservation and shortages but also floods and water quality issues. So these are things familiar to Samanet and there are many of the researchers around the table. In terms of energy, conservation and energy security issues were the highest ranking ones. But a lot of other exciting things like energy pricing or water pricing were just of no interest at all, very low interest by think tank-like organizations. Can I have the next slide, please? Now I'm going to get to some of the more nuanced findings from the survey, rather than just a descriptive documentation of percentages of this and that. One of the questions we're interested in because of our interest in knowledge base, on the use of knowledge and evidence, et cetera, is that learning should be an important part of this. Or if you're going to um, adapt your organization, help the country you work in adapt, learning's an important too. So we measured organization learning looking at whether they got more effective or proficient at certain things. And these are some of the things that we checked. And we also checked that they were flexible enough on a policy issue that they would shift position as a result of interacting with stakeholders. Next slide, please. So this is some results of a statistical analysis of trying to understand what factors influence organizational learning. 
And you see that PLIO practices and strategies related to learning, connecting and engaging are all associated with organizational learning. Organizations can actively create learning opportunities through having reviews, through MEL processes, et cetera, and reflecting on campaign success and failures and so on. Openness to collaboration was also associated with organizational learning. So organizational learning's got a rich number of things that are associated with it. It's not demonstrating cause and effect, but it's really quite interesting the importance of organizational learning to the use of knowledge. Next slide, please. Three engagement, looking at our questionnaire was designed to measure how all these organizations engaged with the public policy process. And you'll see this, this table shows three different strategies. One is to meet lots of officials, go to their events, um, invite them to your events, et cetera. But basically face-to-face -face meeting with officials or Zoom to Zoom meeting maybe these days. Another approach is to go public and change shape public opinion on topics rather than going to government straight away, going to officials straight away. And another is to try to, over time, not in one of a single event or crisis, but over time, develop relationships between policy and practice and think tanks and PIOs and manage those boundaries so that they each understand each other well. So when you look at these results, you can see that the predictors for different engagement strategies are, are rather different and specific to each. For example, network connectedness is closely associated with adopting the meet official strategies, meet officials. You need to have networks to get to them. That 0.46, lots of stars, but not the other two strategies. So there's a rich and slightly complex things. It depends on the strategy that uh, organization adopts. Next slide, please. PIOs received multiple benefits from being a member. They're already members of some networks and alliances, the vast majority. For example, networking or connecting with others and access to funding. And, and also increased likelihood of policy influence from working with others, from having a network. So this is quite a, an important thing for us going forward in that they already have quite, they like networks and alliances and they get stuff from being with, with them. Next slide, please. So we measured what kinds of policy advice organizations gave. And we found that having your policy advice adopted in full or partly, this is we counted as a success and example of policy influence, was more likely for PIOs that were better connected, which is consistent with the organizational learning one before, who had foreign funding and who had gender equality and social inclusion uh, policies in their workplace. So this is linked to the GSD, GSD work. Next slide, please. In terms of capacity building needs, there's a, a whole list of things related to project management shown here, but there's also another set on policy research, another set on how to engage stakeholder themes. So there's quite a few topics that they would like to strengthen. Can I have the next slide, please? So we're nearly near, near complete. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So this. The Scorpion survey had many limitations, leaving plenty of room for future work. We especially encourage more work on the knowledge roles of PIOs, drawing on hints from the survey and the importance of learning, engaging, and connecting. Can I have the next slide, please? Despite these limitations, several conclusions and illustrative recommendations can be drawn. The examples I put up on the slide here illustrate sort of matching conclusion and recommendations in relationship to the program that we have come to talk about itself. I perhaps won't read them all out, but starting at just at the top one, for example, 
PIOs are aware of the benefits of belonging to a network alliance. So program one, pro program C1 really needs to recognize this expectation is already out there from, from their experiences. And so when you have the design, you bet, you've got to think about having grants and capacity building things, et cetera. They already have a level of appreciation about what they want and it's probably going to expect it again. So I can have the next slide, I think should be the last slide. So I'd like to end with a thanks to many people, but in particular, the co-authors and partner leaders of the who worked on the surveys in the four countries and some really hardworking advisors that put a lot into the design of the survey instrument. And all of us will assume we'll one day be writing this as a, a research article too that will boost the credibility of the Scorpion survey. So thank you. I hope that wasn't too much over time or under time. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis. And it was great to hear what the scoping study results were. So thank you so much for sharing the findings with all of us. So now I'll open the floor if anyone has any questions that you want to ask Dr. Lewis or his team who have conducted this scoping study. All right, I see a hand raised. Can we pass the mic to Erin, please? Over to you, Erin. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Louis. This was uh, very interesting. And uh, I think even though you presented slowly and methodically, it was a little too fast still for me to process everything. Um, but I, I was interested in one of the slides, especially it was very interesting. You found that a predictor of policy impact was uh, uh, gender focused foreign funding networks and, uh, and energy was also a predictor as a topic. Uh, I was curious if you, what, uh, it would be interesting to hear what was not a predictor of policy impact. Was there anything that surprised you that maybe we often talk about that this is important to have a policy impact, but it wasn't a strong predictor? And then I also had a question. I think one of the things that uh, Summernet and the Mekong think tanks really tries to do is uh, to, to get, uh, to support researchers to work closely with uh, uh, boundary partners, stakeholders to co-design research, to think about, you know, even before the research starts, what, uh, what are the stakeholders interested in to achieve a greater impact of the research? And, and I wondered if you had any questions that could have picked up on that to see if that was a strong predictor of policy impact. Thanks. Well, if, we, if we take this question now, it'd be useful to have slide Number nine up, I think it is, or 10. We are putting that up, Dr. Lewis. So I may not be able to give all the detailed answers, Aaron, without looking in the notes more, more closely. But and this is an initial scoping survey, so we didn't answer everything. But it, it's these predictors are ones that are correlated after you take into account all the other variables that, that might have been factors. So other things were not significant. So the gender, so what do they mean and how to interpret it? Well, qualitative research is clearly an important follow-up. For example, that if you had a high score on workplace policies in your organization, it meant you're more likely to have your policy advice adopt. That's clearly not a direct relationship, but it may be an indicator of how progressive an organization is, how inclusive it is. And being inclusive is, when, if you can figure out ways of doing it, it's, it's something that um, the people these were trying to influence want. So the policy advice adopted scale we had was everything from no impact at all, acknowledged but not used, partly used and fully used. So, that, so that's a, so there's some, Other things that were not significant that you might have expected were significant were some of the things related to boundary management, for example, where a boundary partners. So just can I have the next slide, please? Uh, I think it'll be slide 10.
this one. So again, we can go through them bit by bit, but it, it's not the boundary one, sorry. If you, the organizations that learn well are ones where they often took the boundary management strategy, which makes sense. They stay, because these boundary management strategies means these organizations put themselves somewhere between policy and research or between policy and practice or between research and practice. And they try to translate the language, the statistics to make it understandable to the to the other to, to each other, but also the interests of each other. But experience-based knowledge, which is primarily in, in this region often means local knowledge or grassroots knowledge, did not. So this is one of these ones that what didn't come out as expected, given the importance people have written on, on these topics quite often. Um, the experience-based knowledge was negatively associated with organizational learning. So not only was it not making it better, it was actually seemed to be detrimental. Um, we had, again, the, 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 the meaning of this doesn't mean local experience-based knowledge is, is rubbish, it's not useful. It just might mean that it's not recognized as learning. I mean, it's a it's tacit. People don't realize that they're learning by doing. So more, more things to probe in here. Other things were mostly along the lines that theory and work at other parts of the world would predict. Being network connected takes you to more sources of knowledge, more sources of expertise, and peers means you can your organization can learn. So partial answer, Aaron, to a deep question. We have more in here than we can show, but it's also, we don't have everything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis, for responding to Aaron's question. So any other questions from the floor? Uh, I see Dr. Fag this and it's raised, I'll just pass the mic. I'm sorry, I'm not there in person, but I'm grateful for the organizers to allow me to still contribute remotely. Thank you, Dr. Lebo. Uh, I'm Peck Day from the Summer Net Steering Committee. I actually have follow-up question, similar line with Aaron was asking uh, on the predictors. Um, the question is around uh, two points. Um, first is the entry point for the research in order to actually make policy impact. Um, I question, where is the entry point? Are we coming from just lit review saying that, okay, based on the lit review, these are policy related questions, or it actually should be more emphasized in terms of how do we come into what is actually the topic that is policy relevant by working it out with the policymakers that we're trying to work with. Um, so that in the end, the products that is produced in the research process is actually being used because it is actually speaking to what is actually the demand from the policymaker themselves and not from what the literature review is saying should be the knowledge gaps. And the uh, related question to, related point to that is actually um, what I didn't see in the predictor, maybe it's not in the presentation, but in the study itself is the trust that has to be built with the policymakers in order for them to even actually listen and read the papers that we want them to read because I imagine that uh, just based on the work that we have been doing with the summit, that if the policymakers are not really having the trust and relationship that has been built over years of interactions, it's unlikely that uh, they will even consider reading whatever that we think that they should be reading. Thank you. Okay, a lot of interesting things in your comment. Um, factors like trust is important, for example, to legitimacy. Um, whether you have to keep explaining everything on every step or, or in fact, people allow you to get on with it, the task. Trust is important. And we ask those questions and have some information about that, but not, not details, just one or two questions. Um, accountability is really important. Um, and one of the features of this, we know from work elsewhere, is that the boundary organizations are duly accountable. They can be accountable to the policymakers, but they can also be accountable to the academics and the scientists, and they try to manage that boundary in between. So there's quite a bit of support in our scoping survey that is sort of consistent with what you're saying is, is, is that, that working at the boundary is rather important. Um, you don't just fire your staff off and expect to do it. But some of the strategy, some of the um, work being done by our organizations is through public opinion rather than directly with officials. 
So they don't all use the same strategy and more detailed look at wh whether how it's related to which issues they're working on. The energy sector is different than the water sector. That pops up quite a few times. So non-significant predictors, there, there are others that weren't shown in the table. So it's not a full representation of the results. You're not seeing all the lack of findings, lack of association information in the PowerPoint. Thank oh, you. Thank you so much. So oh, I think that's all your, all your points, but happy to follow up if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lewis, for responding to that question. I would now like to jump to our online participants if there's any question online, if my colleagues can let me know if there's any question that has been raised by our online participants. All right. We don't have any questions yet but please keep them coming uh, in as we get along with the day. So I'll just uh, look at our audience if there's any more burning questions on this topic right now. All right, if not, I would like to thank Dr. Lewis for sharing the findings of the scoping study. Thank you very much uh, for joining and presenting the results. And now we can move over to the second uh, study which was conducted uh, by the MTT program team, which focuses on key findings of the review of existing networks and why a Mekong Regional Water, Energy and Climate Alliance, which is called WECAN, is needed. So I would like to invite the presenters, Dr. Bhaktan Singh, Component 1 co-lead, Ms. Thu Thwe, Component 1 fellow, and also would like to acknowledge the co-authors, Dr. Chinese, the program director and component one lead, Dr. Andrew Noble, component one advisor, and Dr. Nin Chandrath, component one advisor. Thank you so much. And I see Dr. Singh is already on the podium. So over to you, Dr. Singh. Good morning to everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to present some of the result and the finding of our theme, uh, which is uh, lead by uh, Dr. Chinese and we got supervisor from uh, two colleagues from uh, uh, Dr. Andrew and uh, Dr. Uh, and from uh, CDI and also we support from uh, Bernabot from uh, user at Chama University and the fellow from uh, Vietnam. So next please. Okay, so before coming this, you may ask the question, what is the role of the component one? And as you see that the component is to facilitate the development of the home crowd, regional uh, network alliance of knowledge-based policy influencing uh, organization is uh, in short is called uh, KGBIOs. So what are the actually activity we have conducted so far? Firstly, we review the existing network or alliance and the best practice in the region. Secondly, we designed and plan to establish the strategy for the uh, alliance. And upon this, we developed uh, uh, the, uh, the, um, and recruit the, the member. And lastly is also we uh, support the, the Designed for the, the alliance. Next, please. What has been achieved from the component? Firstly, it's quite important to review the existing program in the region and uh, all this uh, includes. Firstly, to be used uh, the limited 15 uh, organization network to, uh, to interview. We, uh, we organize uh, and uh, assess the lesson learned, the best practice, and we also, uh, based on this, uh, draft the, the report. And lastly, we also uh, commit uh, to complete the quality survey based on the, uh, is complemented to the, uh, the research done uh, by the uh, team uh, number two. And secondly, uh, the second uh, output of this uh, theme is that to develop a small uh, a note on the design and alliance, which is uh, 
provide some kind of the option to uh, the alliance that we can uh, uh, look forward. Next, please. So uh, along this, we uh, see a lot of different activity carried out in this, uh, this program. First, uh, we focus on the different uh, respondent from the institution in the region and most of the study conducted in uh, on water and uh, very few uh, dealing with the sector uh, in uh, energy sector secondly uh, most of the uh, resource uh, focus on the what you call knowledge uh, support uh, uh, for the decision making uh, there's also other type of organization consider themselves as a lobby in Last but not least is also uh, some uh, define themselves as, as think tanks. Uh, nevertheless, we also uh, have not really covered other organization which uh, already mentioned before. This is something that uh, coming from the other uh, part of the uh, organization uh, such as uh, social, uh, uh, local uh, NGO and community uh, organization. And also uh, other thing that uh, we feel that uh, there should be some uh, thing that we have to focus on uh, the other group of uh, what we call the, the advocacy group that uh, we also think that is quite important for the policy uh, engagement. Next, please. As you can see, uh, there's a different uh, governance structure. Uh, we can uh, re uh, reflect in the different kind of uh, Structure. The first one is uh, very much uh, highly structured and is uh, uh, usually covered by uh, the council board and or the executive uh, committee. But also we see also other type of uh, structure such as that uh, with the simply uh, steering committee and the secretariat. There's also another type of uh, structure that we can find uh, mostly uh, working on the uh, program and. Uh, that is something that we can see there's a diversity of the, the structure that we are looking for. Next, please. There's also many different strategies how we uh, can uh, inform the policy. Uh, for example, we uh, use uh, a lot of uh, different uh, approach to, uh, and strategy to uh, contact and to uh, uh, formulate the policy. Secondly, we think that uh, this is also quite important uh, to have uh, not only the virtual uh, uh, co co connection, but also the uh, person in person uh, um, uh, connection is quite important uh, in this process. And this is quite uh, uh, important why we uh, gather uh, 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 through this kind of dialogue, because uh, we think that the uh, person in person uh, meeting is quite uh, a challenge for our engagement. And this we, we think is also the issue of co-design uh, uh, of the issue uh, contrib contribute uh, in the beginning by the end user is quite important. That's why we think this is quite uh, important to uh, uh, identify in the, uh, and and this uh, the co-design this uh, need uh, right in the beginning before we start uh, doing some research. We should uh, make sure that those need has we uh, explain in uh, in in. Uh, the, elaborated uh, incorporation with the end user. And this is quite important for our engagement that uh, we have to change the way how we uh, make use of our research is uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, moving away from more linear approach from uh, research to policy to what more kind of uh, engaging the, the end user in, in the issue of when they formulate the need and then how can they be articulated in, in, our, uh, in our design is quite important. And we think that uh, this is why we uh, think that this the joint uh, uh, teamwork uh, is quite uh, quite important. And as uh, you uh, already uh, learned from the survey, that uh, trust is uh, considered a very important uh, issue or the, the, the capital that we have to build uh, before we conduct any uh, research and implement it. And then this is quite important uh, key message that we learned that the trust uh, to be built is uh, very essential uh, in the first place. Next, please. 
So now come to the issue, what are the, uh, what are the challenge that we are facing when we uh, try to uh, set up this kind of alliance? Firstly, um, maintaining the membership and uh, the active participation is very uh, expensive and costly. That is also quite uh, required a certain uh, management uh, issue. And as we see, as the trust building is quite uh, important uh, at, uh, to, to be considered. And the last one is uh, how can we ensure that uh, those uh, concerns uh, can be expressed in the more uh, democratic, uh, democratic and transparency uh, manner. Next, please. Could you next, please? Yes, uh, to ensure the long-term uh, sustainability, we have to consider the following aspect. First, we have to uh, identify what are the strategic uh, issues that uh, our alliance have to uh, concern, and uh, this is quite uh, important uh, to begin with. The next one is uh, how to ensure the communication and how to make sure that uh, our branding has been uh, recognized and uh, further developed uh, during the course of the uh, implement, uh, of developing of our alliance. And that's uh, other thing that is quite important is a financing issue. How can we ensure that we uh, receive the financial support uh, throughout the, the, the development and to ensure that we uh, are uh, more uh, diversify in uh, finding the different uh, funding sources from different uh, donors. Next, please. So the, the question is, uh, why are we come here to uh, discuss about the alliance? First, uh, we learn from the survey that uh, there's a long, uh, the, there's a strong interest from the respondent, uh, all saying that uh, there's a need to address the issue uh, or the nexus between water, energy, and climate, this is quite obvious. And this is something that we also learned that uh, most of the idea uh, coming uh, from the outside of the region, that's why we still think that this is quite important to create our own capacity to come up with our old agenda and we can come up with uh, our own uh, way to uh, address and uh, to uh, to uh, discuss the issue that we we, we learn from uh, the need of the community or the need of the end user and that is something that we think that uh, for the future of our alliance it is quite important to uh, coming here into uh, discuss and uh, try to find a way how we build our alliance for the future because uh, this aligned will ensure that uh, how the coming uh, the current uh, the the program uh, project or activity implement will uh, contribute to the build the aligned and uh, these two coming year will be considered as kind of piloting time where the each member or consortium uh, can share their own experience and collectively contribute to set up our uh, common strategy, how we build up our alliance and how we can sustain this kind of alliance in the coming years. Next, please. So the very important question that's when uh, occur when everyone come to this conference is, what are the benefits that you join the alliance? There's following benefit that you can join when you uh, uh, when you uh, become the, the the member of our alliance. Firstly, you can uh, uh, join the annual meeting of the alliance to uh, exchange your experience and your research and uh, activity. The second one is to uh, attend on the building capacity event. Firstly, we can. Uh, get some kind of uh, financial support through the alliance. Next one is to uh, 
come uh, to uh, engage in different kind of policy dialogue and, and forum. Last but not least, is also to uh, exchange and sharing our experience uh, across the 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 the, the, can, uh, the 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 country in the region. So that's why uh, we are quite exciting to look forward to welcome uh, every one of uh, the network in uh, aligned to uh, come to the to the meeting today and to share our old. Uh, your our old experience how can we contribute uh, collectively to build our alliance in the coming years next please so uh, with this i would like to uh, end my presentation and thank you for your listening and uh, we are ready to uh, respond to any question and clarification thank you thank you thank you so much dr singh uh, i see dr china's wants to respond to the presentation so i'll pass it on to her first uh, up to you if you want to speak from here or you want to get up on the dais. Hello. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Singh, or I call him Einstein. So he's really, really um, long-term supporters of uh, uh, in the region so much uh, since the phase one of summit 18 years already that we have been working on this. Uh, I just want to highlight again what Dr. Singh presented here is the work in progress. Uh, what we really discuss internally is among the program consortium members and also uh, DFAT and other members um, that uh, the idea of having alliance is really how we can really build on the existing initiatives, networks, and whatever the programs that everyone here working. We thought that, okay, if we have the network, we already have solo networks. Or, but if we say alliance, or if we said it, there are like certain aspects of the things that we can come to work together. Even we are from uh, water sectors or energy sectors or climate or other sectors, we come to work together. But this is still work in progress. That's why sometimes you see uh, we call this as the Lily Initiative. And also now we invite for uh, corporations into the common work that really we have the passions. But uh, please, looking forward to our future um, kind of directions for what we say here as alliance or network. But the idea behind this is really how we can create a platform. How can we uh, create the opportunities for us to work across the sectors to really serve the need for the legion. And I would like to give the big credit to all cut up members in a components, uh, component one. And uh, here we have Dr. Singh. Uh, we have put Andrew at the backside. We have uh, Dr. Chandrit sitting there. We have Tui. We have so many people. And I would very really much convey my sincere thanks to 15 organizations who are managing the networks. They, because uh, we have many sensitive questions, really, about the, how they manage network. What are the challenges you think? They really, give truly valuable and so inspiring uh, information to our team to learn from how can we work together. So yeah, so now the floor is open. So if anyone would like to give any suggestions or questions to the, uh, the talk that uh, Dr. Singh already conveyed on behalf of us, so please so share with us. So I'm here also to help response. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chinese. I think uh, we should use this kind of opportunity to get input from you, how we can develop jointly our alliance in the coming years, what kind of uh, challenge we are going to face in order to make our alliance to be sustained in the near future is quite essential. In, 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 in terms of uh, how can we make use of our alliance also in relation to the ongoing summit and how can we build up on summit where Summonet is considered a, a kind of long-term commitment of Sweden to build up the research capacity in the region regarding the sustainable development. How can we build on this network to make our research more policy re relevant, to make our policy more addressing the local need and how to ensure the knowledge that we co-produce have to be start very much in the beginning of our journey, not to wait until the end. So this is something we very much want to listen to your all experience and your experience can help us to design 
the different option that we can present later on to the uh, pro program steering committee to get uh, at, at the end uh, a decent which which option we are going to, to to move forward. So that is quite in the uh, in the kind of uh, learning uh, period that we would li like to to use it. Yeah. Please. Um, um, Dr. Singh, we have uh, Dr. Fakde, if you can just wait yes, for a moment you, because, because Dr. I, Lewis had had uh, yes. his hand raised for quite some so time. So over to ask. you, Dr. Lewis, and then we'll come to Dr. Fakde to share his uh, question or response. So over to you, Dr. Lewis. Just very short, but I think uh, alliance is a strong word compared to a network. It implies some shared values. So we need a common concern, a common opportunity or some common imperatives, some com joint value that we're worried about. I don't see that we have that yet. I think that is going to be the big challenge. Um, an alliance is not just an assembly for no reason. They've got to have a real purpose. And we haven't identified that purpose yet. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Lewis. Dr. Singh, if you want to add no, to I, that I, first. I wait All right. Until I so us. we pass the floor to Dr. Fagbe to share his question or response. Thank you. I thought I just raised hand because I didn't see anyone raising it. <laughs> okay. But I, I also have like some clarification question and also some suggestion just based on your presentation. Um, in addition to what Dr. Luis mentioned, I also wanted to ask a clarification question. So am I understanding it correctly that under the MTT, um, this word alliance is now going to be used in a similar way, like what we have been using with Summonnet? That's the clarification question. Um, and then the suggestions to the questions that you propose, maybe two points from my side. Uh, based on the presentation that you presented. So you were emphasizing the co-design of research activities with the end user. Um, based on the experience that we have with Summonet, this thing actually takes a lot of effort and time and resources. So how does that actually build into MTT? Um, is that in the way that grant is being made, is it actually recognized that efforts and time and resources has to be put into uh, actually working with the end users and not just having it as an add-on at the end? Um, so that's the suggestion and also a bit of a question how the MTT will be designing. Um, the second point uh, I would like to make is that we know that policy making is actually an iterative process that takes many, many iterations, but then research has very finite timeline and usually it's one-off. So how do the MTT program steering committee think of iteration when it comes to actually trying to make uh, policy impacts? Because I think it's a bit unrealistic to have one program for five years and then expect to have a lot of policy uh, impacts because we know that like maybe one law take like five, 10 years to actually go through the process. So maybe just a question of like, what is the long-term vision of uh, the Alliance? Is it just a lion for five years and then that's it? Or there will be like iterative process also? So that's really fantastic questions. And uh, Adan Luis also, so thank you so much for your questions, Race. Uh, comment, Race. I think so, you're really right. When you come to Alliance, we actually not really come to join the events and something like that. We have really common value and this is some things in the making process. So I would say very much uh, appreciate that uh, the understanding and also so much passions uh, among the program steering committees of the Mekong Thought Leadership and Think Tank Network and also program steering committees of the summonets to, and yesterday we actually have joint lunch together really to see how uh, we can build on what summonets already have with knowledge co-productions, really majorities of the network members are uh, academic research and those who really care about knowledge productions. But I would still want to say that having this uh, Mekong Thought Leadership and Think Tank Network could actually enhance uh, what someone is already good at in the way there's several aspects that we are now actually considering. One is, of course, we need to really build on the trust, long-term partnership, and the connections, and really the issue, issue of inclusiveness. The summonet already gives so much good ground, but what are the things that we could really enhance immediately as a program, I'm the program director of both, I really see 
uh, the merit of having this Mekong Tall Education Think Tank Network is really to make sure that uh, the program as a network or alliance actually trying to look at those groups who used to be our boundary. Uh, as Louis mentioned about boundary management and how can we actually engage those who been identified as bodily earlier to be in the alliance. Those who really passions, those who have responsibilities in formulating the policy or do the practice. We are not really looking forward to, again, do the research and inform policy, but we are looking forward to really co-production, not only knowledge, co-production of solutions, who can tell us what is the practical solutions? There's only those who really working in policy arenas who tell us whether that option solution is practical. Do we have enough money? Are they affecting people? So that are the area where we see how we can enhance together using this opportunity of having Mekong Thaw Leadership and Think Tank Network with the summit, which already have a strong ground. And I would say we will very much rely on advice and really long-term, long-sized visions of the steering committees of both program to really advise us as here we are implementer, Secretaria to move onward with also strong support from Swedish and also the Australian government. I see so much really hope and I see so much positive values for us to move forward. And I think uh, um, Dr. Park Day, Kun Park Day or um, Park Day, so you are the chair, co-chair of the program steering committee of the summit. This is also our work to work together to really make this happen. And Ajahn Louis also. So we really uh, must identify what really common value for us to really continue working together. Either we call them as alliance, call us ourselves as alliance or the network. So, but the idea is there. We want to be more inclusive. We want to have more partners and friends joining this effort. So maybe I just stop here. So I don't know whether, and when you say the short term two or five years, we are not really looking that time frame. The Mekong Thaw Leadership Net, uh, and Think Tank Network program ending October, 2025. But here, we are living here. I'm here working in the Mekong region more than 20 years. And we also have Ajahn Pichai here, 50 years and 30 years. We are here who are hosting all guests coming to help Smackle. We are here to drive the agenda, what we need. And I don't see any issues at all. If we have this program and we will have other programs, as long as we have really common vision, what we would like to see in the future for us and future generation. Uh, one thing I would like to echo this, this kind of effort is that uh, trust is something quite important. And as you know, to almost four phase of summit, we already consider as trust partner, not only among the institution joint, but also to the donor. So this is something that we already gained some values that we can make use of on this way. The second, how can we make use of our resource uh, impact in influencing? That's why we broaden the concept of uh, what is the knowledge by uh, influencing organization, which included those who are mostly forgotten and most marginalized group of people who are not forgot, forgotten in this kind of uh, forum, that we make sure that they are heard. They make sure that those vulnerable group like women can be heard more. And that's why we think uh, the, 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 the MTT can help us to strengthen this kind of direction and to make sure that, that our, we make sure that those who are not heard is now is the chance that you join us to share with us your experience, your, 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 your problem, your issue that we are going jointly, collectively define the way how we address the issue and the way how we co-produce the, the solution. And the whole issue, uh, that's another aspect that is the learnings is quite important for every of us so that we can ensure that what we achieve through this network and alliance can be shared cross and not see only learning in organization learning, but also policy learning is so important for the donor because this is a very good opportunity for the donor to come to sit together and to see, to help us, how can we deal with the kind of grand challenge 
that we're facing now in the region, this kind of transboundary issue cannot be solved individual and country, that we need this kind of trans transboundary issue to be dealing de 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 with in the our line. That's one thing I like to uh, address as is something valued that we think that our line can make this uh, more uh, bold and more clear. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Singh and Dr. China. So I think uh, we are all in the same, uh, uh, you know, uh, place and we have that feeling transpiring to each and every one of us that yes, we can because we have that ability and we are all here today because we have common vision for the region. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and big round of applause thank for you. both of them. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much.